Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and thank you for joining us for one of our talks today. Today's guest is the wonderful Himesh Patel, currently starring in the movie Don't Look Up, as well as the HBO Max series Station Eleven. And I wanted to start by talking about Station Eleven because I think it's such a phenomenal accomplishment in terms of what you have to do with this character, because in essence, you're playing him over the span of 20 years. Um, and facing multiple catastrophic emotional events within that lifetime for him on screen. And so I was really fascinated in what your kind of character development process looked like in looking at each of these subsets of scenes and where is he emotionally, where is he psychologically, where is he physically even within each of these moments throughout the series so that you can really create this beautifully linear performance, but also with these very different moments and approaches character-wise. Yeah, it was a huge undertaking, um, but I was very well supported by a fantastic team, and um, and that made life a lot easier. Um, and in some regards, uh, the delay that we experienced because of uh, of the pandemic, the the real life pandemic, um, meant that I I had a bit more time to consider it and and to discuss with Patrick his plans for Jeevan and uh, and so I could start uh, preparing or at least conceptualizing uh, his journey. Yeah and your character Jeevan strikes up this friendship with this young girl Kirsten because they end up together on the night that everything kind of sets in and everybody starts hunkering down at home um, and I, I kind of it's such a beautiful relationship friendship between these two characters that exists then throughout the series and i thought it was interesting in the approach that you had to find of finding this dynamic that gradually becomes a little bit more parental but at the same time it isn't a fully parental role but he does become her protector and so i was very interested in in how you thought about that specific dynamic in that relationship and worked to build it out with matilda lawler who plays that character yeah it was it was very interesting when we had to sort of explore early on. I mean, for starters, it was great with Matilda. She's a phenomenal actress and just so um, collaborative and just a grown up. Basically, she's like any other actor. There's that, you know, you, I forget that I'm working with a with a quote unquote child actor. Um, so uh, that was very helpful in terms of what we were trying to do, which was to get under the skin of what is a very complex relationship and a complex interaction that leads to them sort of being with each other um, as the world ends around them. Um, specifically, I think we landed on the moment in the parking lot where he Jeevan says to Kirsten, you know, you have to make a choice. I can't make this choice for you because, you know, that would be kidnapping, I think. Um, and I think in thinking about their relationship, Kirsten recognizes something in him, in, in Jeevan, that he doesn't necessarily know or recognize. Um, and that's why she trusts him. That's why she goes with him. He's just sort of trying to do the right thing, but is a bit like, it'll be fine. I'll just drop her off at home. Obviously, at that point, when they're in the parking lot, it's clear to him that he's in a bind. Um, and he can either let her go to, to her fate or he can do the right thing, which he knows he has to do. And I think when he comes up with that elaborate lie about knowing her parents and or Frank knowing her parents and it'll be fine, and I think... That's a, it's a test in a way of trust of, of him saying, you, you know, I have to say this, I have to just pretend. And I, if, and it, and it is up to you what you do. And she goes, okay, you know, and we landed on that being sort of the key moment of trust between them. Um, and I think what the show does is from that point onwards, it tests their trust, um, how much they trust each other, but also, I guess, specifically how much Kirsten trusts Jeevan. And, uh, and it's a really fascinating journey they go on. 
Yeah, and they're, they're thrust together through circumstance, but in essence, when he first meets her and then he's like, I'll take you home because the person who is supposed to be there to do that for her just isn't around. And so she doesn't have any supervisory adult that can help her at all. Um, and yet at the same time, I feel like you also do such a good job together at making sure that it always feels like a comfortable relationship between the two of them. Um, and even even down to that line that you just brought up where he's like, you know, you have to make this choice because otherwise it's kidnapping. I can't tell you that you have to come to a to someone's home with me. Um, and was it was it easy to find the lines of what that relationship needed to look like and feel like in order for it to feel very natural and very comfortable and for the audience to immediately step into it with you? I think in terms of uh, conceptually, there was there was discussion. Um, one of the first things I remember when I got to, to Chicago in January to shoot the show in January 2020. This is um, we sat down myself, Patrick Somerville, Hero, Marai, and and Matilda Lawler. We all sat down to discuss that the their relationship, but also how do we how do we get them to this place? You know, without it without it seeming odd. Um, although being odd isn't bad, but it, it, it's about how it has to make sense for both of them. Um, but I think what made it easy was was that I loved working with Matilda. I, I think I hope she liked working with me, and so there was a there was a chemistry there and a rapport, which meant that it, there was an intangible thing there, which is that there was a connection. There was a recognition between two people. Um, and I think you can you can tell that's something that you can't really write. Um, and I'm very proud of that. Yeah. And there's a couple of moments within the series in which we're seeing a slightly different perspective of a moment. So there's a moment where um, the older Kirsten, played by Mackenzie Davis, is revisiting a scene from when she was a child and in essence is in the room watching your character Kirsten and Frank and you know kind of replaying incidents and with those scenes in particular did you all want to approach them in the same way that you've been approaching other scenes or did you feel like tonally there was a slightly different space that you wanted to capture because in essence you're playing out what is someone's memory on screen in that moment I think that's where our brilliant director for that episode Lucy Cheniak she really brought some really um, interesting ideas to the form of the whole thing um, some of which have remained, some of which have not remained, but um, it, it gave us the, a sense of what we were aiming towards. Um, she had a very clear vision for, for that episode and what it would be. And it meant that we all knew what we were working towards. Um, and we could just concentrate on playing the truth of each moment. Um, and, and we understood what um, everyone behind the camera was trying to achieve um, in order to tell that story in the most interesting way. And with all of the trauma that he's experiencing as a character, um, how would you kind of go into the scenes and really think about the impact of what that was going to be? Because it also feels like there's a lot of moments in your performance that become a little bit more internalized as the series goes on. Um, and some of that's kind of a byproduct of the moments where he's not with Kirsten, you know, because he's obviously going to be more externalized as a character when he's there for a kid as, as the protector. But then the scenes where you're by yourself, there's a lot more opportunity to play with the internalized journey with him as a character. And so I was interested in, in how you kind of navigated those different landscapes. I think there's that constant question with Jeevan of, of that sort of performative side of things. But one thing I was often thinking about was with him, and I think probably something I recognized really in what a Drew me to him as a character is the expectations that he has of who he should be for any given person. And I think an idea of sort of a, a sense of masculinity or, 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 um, or paternalism that I think he feels he should be living up to, but he struggles with. And it's, an, you know, he's full of these insecurities and, um, and you know some of them are insecurities that I really recognised, and so there was a lot for me to draw on in that in that regard. Um, but also how those insecurities can become so damaging to a relationship, to uh, ultimately so destructive um, to to a relationship, um, and and how that can happen to anyone. And it's not about being a bad person or a good person. It's about 
the, the complexities of a person, especially when faced with the kind of traumas that he that he experiences. And I thought the moment where he's asked about if he'd known that this virus, that this flu was coming and what it was going to do, what he would have done differently or what his regrets are. And his regrets are all based in not spending more time with his family and not being for them more. Yeah. And when you read the scripts, did that give you a really core foundation of what was important to him and the type of person that he was? Because that was the most meaningful for th thing for him to regret. Yeah, I think it really epitomizes uh his thing of just you know he's never there on time he's never at the right place at the right time and his feeling of not of not being enough for the people around him not doing enough i think that's why he's so desperate for frank to come with them and why what ends up happening is so heartbreaking um because you know, he he really thought it was a chance. For, I think it, it, it's a real example of a, a sort of a perverse thought that, that that can come in, which is that he he sees he's almost excited by what's happening because it's giving him a chance to redefine who he is in his position. But I think Frank knows that he knows what he's trying to do, and Frank doesn't want that. And I think Frank knows that that's not going to be helpful to Jeevan. That's not what Jeevan needs either. Um, and, uh, but I think that moment where he talks about, you know, that we would have been together and we would have been a family is also so telling about, of what he wanted. He wanted, he wanted to, to be together as a family. You know, and, and it, you sort of, you hinted at what his past is. We never go into it. There were drafts of the script where we did sort of touch on his past, but um, he he hints at, at who his parents are, who they are, like you know, what is that? Um, but it, it really it, it makes sense to me that his thread then ends up being family, you know, of various sorts. Um, but I think family is what he's always looking for. And did you view him as a character who for a long time has kind of struggled with that idea of who who he wants to be against who he is and what, you know, figuring out what his identity is, or if that was kind of a particular moment for him in life? Because there is that moment at the beginning where Kirsten's asking him, well, what do you do? What's your job? And he gives about five different answers, but never even gives an answer because he just has so much uncertainty in himself at that moment. Yeah, he has no idea. You know, he's adrift. Um, he doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know what he should be doing. But what I think what the show does from, from the opening seconds, you, you see this guy do what seems to be the stupidest thing in the world, which is he sees a guy dying and tries to jump up on stage and help him when he doesn't know CPR. So what was he trying to do? Like, what was the point? <laughs> that's the question in terms of Jeevan. That's the question that we're asking. What drove him to do that? because it's absurd and he gets an answer towards the end of episode nine someone tells him you know you're a healer you, you want to help and that's that's who he is um i just think he he had to find a way to 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 make it um useful you know find to find the meaning in what that is it also feels like as well, you know, what you were just saying about this almost puts him in a good place because he starts to find a purpose, even right at the very beginning, you know, when he jumps on stage, it's it's about the uncertainty and channeling it into actions. Okay, we're going to go to the grocery store and we're going to buy absolutely everything that we might need for the next few weeks because we're going to be shut into an apartment. Um, and so did you look at his some, him as someone who's really able to take a lot of those internal aspects, but to channel them in very specific ways? And like, I feel like if I'm doing something, if I'm making an action, then everything's going to be okay for this moment. You've, you've hit the nail on the head there. I think it, it's, and it's behavior that I, I notice all the time. I think everyone does it to some degree. We, we, we're aware on some level that the problem is bigger, that it's a deeper rooted thing, but for now we'll just, yeah, we'll put a bandaid over it. We'll just do, you know, 
But it, 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 Sia, his sister Sia, she asks that question in episode one. She's like, one of my brothers has a Nobel Prize, and the other one, or one a Pulitzer or something, whatever it is, one of them has won an award, and the other one eats cereal for dinner. Why, why did I call that the the second one? It's probably because she knows that he'll do something. He's reactive. He will, you know, he'll do the thing that everyone else thinks is stupid. And nine times out of ten, it is stupid. But this is that tenth time that it's not. And that's she knows that he's the right one to call, because Frank won't do anything. Frank will just, you know, it'll be fine. And this is the one time that it won't be. And uh, so you're right. His his sort of reactive nature, his his band aid philosophy, um, sort of actually comes in comes in to be helpful, but. That that that's tested as the story goes on, you know, because that it's not it's not uh, sustainable to live that way. And you know, with his sibling relationship with Frank, that's also another really interesting dynamic to get to explore because, you know. They're close to each other, but there's still friction between them when he first shows up at his apartment and then they're locked into this space and ultimately become co-parents to Kirsten together. Um, and so I was interested in in how you wanted to approach that relationship and all of the different layers that, that the scripts gave you to unpack and explore with that. Yeah, it was really great. And Naban is such a great actor and, and a really great guy. And, and it was nice to speak to him about who who these two guys are and, and what their relationship is. Um, but I think it was always uh, fairly easy because he had such a great grasp on his character. He knew who Frank was clearly. He knew how he wanted to play him. And I think we just knew instinctively what their, what their dynamic is. Um, and, and there are these wonderful layers that are there in the writing. Um, we get hints as to what their relationship is. And obviously, specifically that story that he tells about when he gets his injury and and that he woke up and Jeevan was there. It's another example of Jeevan's sort of reactive nature, but it was again that that sort of tenth time out that it, it's actually the right thing. It's exactly what he needed. Um. So there's definitely a lot of love between them, even though they're so different as people. Um, and yeah, I thought it was a really wonderfully written sibling relationship um, uh, and done in a really unique way, actually. Yeah. And the initial solution, quote unquote, for everything that's going on is, you know, go to Frank's apartment, stay inside, don't go anywhere, seal the place up, make sure that you've got food. And he successfully achieves that, but he's then the he's then the first person to go, this isn't sustainable, like you were saying before, you know, we need different types of solutions. And he's very realistic about what the outside world might look like when they step outside and how people may behave and act. And the fact that if there are other people around that it's going to be a more violent existence and the skill sets that they need to start thinking of and developing for themselves. And then there is even a moment where we see Jeevan having to enact on that violence as well, likely for the first time in his life to that degree. Um, and so I was interested in how you kind of found that particular arc within him of, you know, okay, we've, we've solved everything. And then almost the unacceptance of, okay, this doesn't work anymore and having to create an entirely new set of rules for himself and survival instincts. Yes. I think I, I sort of, we, we played with that moment a lot, not least in terms of the choreography of, of the, the fight, but also the, there was a there was a point at which it Jeevan was it was a, a, a lot more drawn out the way that he he had to kill the intruder and I think what we realized was that that's not him he it it would pain him too much to, to have to do that he was going to strangle the guy basically and so it wound up being that we landed on the fact that he just sort of, you know, there's a, there's a blow to the head, but, but in playing it, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't just pure anger. For me, that whole moment is, 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 
it's painful, not least because of what's happening, but also because they were so close. They were so close to leaving to, to, to the plan, to Jeevan's plan, I suppose, coming to fruition. Um, but also he doesn't, you know, he doesn't want to have to do something like that, but he doesn't have a choice because the beginning of that, of that sequence, he tries to reason with the guy. He gave him a chance, you know, and I think um, I think that's why he winds up doing what he what he does. But I I wanted to make sure that it was clear in, in well not necessarily clear, but for me uh, for my performance internally, I I wanted to make sure that I wasn't playing it as a sort of you know have that sort of moment. It was it was definitely a I don't want to do this moment. Yeah, and. Station Eleven and Don't Look Up are two very different projects for you character wise. But the one parallel between them is you're playing two characters who receive news of impending doom and are some of the only people who know, you know, in Station Eleven, people are kind of starting to figure it out. But when his sister calls him, he really just gets that sense of, OK, this is very real and this is what's happening. Um, and in Don't Look Up, your character is dating Jennifer Lawrence's character who tells him there's a comet coming towards Earth and it has the possibility to eradicate all of mankind. Um, and so I was interested in looking at the idea of s receiving a similar type of news, but for two very different characters, how you found those different trajectories of both the emotional and at times physical response that the two of them enact. Yeah, I thought you were going to say that uh, two characters who receive the news that the, world, the world's ending and have a panic attack, because that's what happens in both things. I, I could not have predicted that I would do two roles back to back <laughs> where, where they receive uh, apocalyptic news and, and have a panic attack. Um, I guess with Don't Look Up, it was, you know, it, my role is far smaller in the, in the tapestry of the, of the movie. So, you know, there's that moment and, and then his response is very petty ultimately and, and, uh, and selfish and, uh, and idiotic. Um, and uh, so it was kind of, not necessarily easy, but it was it was more simple to to uh, conceptualize. You know, that's who he is. And that's what he does. He's that cold blooded um, and uh, dumb. Whereas obviously with Jeevan, it's a lot more complex. It's it's you know it's a it's a panic attack. It's for for real. It's it's a fear and and a sort of yeah a, a reflexive response which uh, which then leads him on the right path for a while. Um, so yeah, sort of similar, similar outset, but very different responses. And with Don't Look Up, was there um, a challenge in, in shaping out what your character's relationship was with Jennifer Lawrence's character, Kate? Because, you know, the initial time they're on the phone together so, so you don't actually really get very much screen time in order to establish it and yet we know you know they've obviously been in a relationship for a while she's met his mother she's made certain comments there's family conflicts that have gone on um you know so we do get that essence of kind of backstory and layering and texture within the relationship but you have very little time in which to establish that so how did you set about that particular challenge um I had a, I had a brief call with Jennifer uh, the, the couple of days before we shot the scene, um, which was which was really nice. She gave me a call and we 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 hadn't ever spoken, we'd never met, so it was nice to speak with her um, before sort of diving onto set. And it was my first the, the first thing that I shot um, during the pandemic, so it, I was nerve I was nervous anyway for that reason. I was nervous because I was about to work with Jennifer Lawrence and Leonardo DiCaprio and, and Adam McKay, and I was, <laughs> I was terrified. So it was nice to. To get a call from her and and uh, and just sort of chat it through, um, and and then when it comes to that sequence on the phone, Jennifer had shot that already, and Adam had done a bunch of improv with her, um, and so he played that back for me before we shot the scene, and he was like, "So this is what you've got to work with, basically. Um, we'll do it on, like on, on scripted. We'll do that." But the way that Adam works is we'll do it scripted two times and or however many times so he knows he's got it. And then let's fly off the handle and just see what happens. Um, and and but it was good for me to know what Jennifer had done 
so that you know it would have made sense if i was just going completely off script because it has to fit obviously it's a phone conversation so um that was really helpful and that was where the whole concept of the mum and the mum thinking she's a lesbian and the you know various other things that were part of that conversation um came came into play um which was fun really fun and what was your journey into who he is as a journalist and, and who he wants to be as well? Because, you know, there's kind of a dichotomy between some of the things he says and some of the things that he does. You know, he's like, oh, I don't want to write this thing that sounds like clickbait. And then that's immediately what he does after she's embarrassed on television. And then he later says he's writing a book called Brush with the Devil about his relationship with her. Yeah. And, you know, we know that he has aspirations to be on morning television and to get that level of attention as well. Um, and so I was interested if there were kind of specific levels or, or research into specific styles of journalism that you really thought of in terms of how he sees himself against who he actually is as, an, as a writer as well. You know, and I didn't do any specific uh, research because I just knew this person. I, I have met this person. I have seen articles written by this person, you know. Um, there's a lot of people like that around. Um, and it's it's a... Uh, it's a currency that works for, for them and and you know that's that's that world um uh, so that's definitely who he is but i think he's he's even less uh he has even less integrity i think um in terms of knowing who he is as a person adam gave that to me on the page it, when you first meet philip and in the script it says philip still mad he didn't get into yale and I had everything I needed, you know, I was like, great. That's who he is. You know, he's, that, that's the root of all his insecurity. Um, and, and why he wants to be known. You know, he, he wants, it, it's like in his head, he's looking, he's, he's um, he wants the people on the Yale admissions board to see his the, like <laughs> clickbait article and think they made a mistake. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the level of idiocy we're dealing with um and insecurity um so was, yeah you know it, that's what makes adam a great writer he just has to put one line in and he trusts he trusts that he the person who's right for this role will know what that means yeah and then lastly i wanted to talk about your journey when you first stepped away from eastenders which you did for about nine years because i think it's it's an incredibly tricky decision to make when you're an actor and you have a very steady job and things are going well to decide if and when to step away from that because you don't know at that point what opportunities are potentially going to lay ahead and whether what you want to do is going to be able to be actualized when you step away from something like that. Um, and so I think it's a really remarkable thing to have done to begin with. And then also with the choices that you made following, you know, it's like you went and starred as as, as a pigeon in your friend's theater production and said it was the most amazing space to really kind of have a lot of freedom and play as an actor. Um, and so I was interested in a lot of the conversations and the dialogue that you were having with yourself around that point when you were making that decision, not only about stepping away from steady work as an actor, but also in terms of where you wanted to try and lay the groundwork for your career to go next and how you set about actualizing that for yourself. I've got to, I've got to say, I, I was just following my nose um and just diving in i uh i knew i had to leave eastenders and not because i i i had uh i was having a bad time it just felt like the right moment um and and i felt that i needed to scare myself um <laughs> So on one hand, the scaring myself was leaving a secure job that I've had for nine years. It's everything I know. Um, on the other hand, it was then doing uh, things that I'd not done before uh, and auditioning. You know, <laughs> what you've got to understand is that I hadn't auditioned in nine years because you can't audition for anything while you're on EastEnders because you can't do the job, you know, you're, you're tied in. 
um, I'd done one short film, which wound up being very important actually later down the line, but uh, I, that's all I'd done while I was East End, at EastEnders. So I, I, I wanted to scare myself, and I, I, that was the only thing that I could conceptualize really in terms of, uh, of an aim. I had no idea where any of it was gonna lead. You know, I, I couldn't have predicted all this that, that's happened to me, and I, I still, you know, I, I'm still pinching myself. I still feel like someone has, has made a mistake and is going to realize, um, you know, so I'm dealing with that imposter syndrome. But um, I, I, I guess I, I just followed my nose. I, I knew I had to leave and I, I knew that I wanted to do things that presented themselves to me. You know, I did another short film with another friend and then this other one of my best mates said let's let, we're going to go to the fringe do you want to come with us and play a pigeon and i went yeah why not great and it changed my life in so many ways you know I, I, in 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 so so many ways so it was the best decision i ever made and um and i i think it's the only thing i can really say is is sometimes the weirdest choice is the best one well, it seems like it absolutely worked out for you. And congratulations on both of these really fantastic projects that you have right now. Thank you so much, Hamesh. Thank you.